History and Freedom <clears throat> by Theodore Adorno. Lecture 13, The History of Nature, 1. January 5th, 1965. Adorno's Notes for this lecture. Later edition. Continue here after the vacation. Fundamental Statement about the Relations Between Nature and History. Hitherto, History as Natural History. Proof. The Primacy of Statistics in Durkheim. Hegel himself speaks of natural history, but in his case, nature is essentially a basis. History is spirit. Spirit itself is naturalistic, therefore belief in nature where history is thematic. Page 64, Marx's quotation, the concept of natural history in Marx taken over from Hegel and reinterpreted. Page 65, the idea of the laws of nature also as a mystification. The idea of natural growth, both real and a socially necessary illusion. Laws of nature not to be taken literally, not to be ontologized. In other words, the laws of nature capable of being abrogated. They are the blind continuation of eating and being eaten as the principle on which reason is modeled and which it no longer needs once it has achieved self-consciousness. That is the pivotal transformation, no other reason only the reason that knows itself. Explain the critique of pure reason. Kant's distinction between the realm of freedom and the realm of necessity to be applied to history. Already to be found in Kant, where the realm of freedom is taken much more seriously, i.e. more freely than in Hegel. Freedom is something that creates itself. In contrast to the naturalistic approach of vulgar Marxism, natural history is a critical concept. History has as yet no global subject. The identification of the proletariat with the latter is, however, text breaks off. Ironically, Marx was a social Darwinist. What the social Darwinist praises is what he regards as negativity. Page 66 at the bottom, quotation from the Grand Reese. Natural history means as much as the mythical character of history. See the Hegel quote above. The cyclical as an archaic image of natural history. Page 69. Below, looking into the abyss, Hegel perceived. Then quotation. Jesus Christ. Sorry, my cat's being a douche. Then quotation, 70 above. Read down to page 75. Later edition that should probably continue here on... 5.1.1965, down to the top of page 70, introduced the idea that the history of nature equals second nature. Hilmar Tillich's notes. On the relations between nature and history, not concerned with the problem of the historical sciences versus the natural sciences, or history as opposed to external nature. The question of natural history is more specifically that of the inner composition of elements of nature, and elements of history within history itself. The theme of nature and history seems to point to a contrast between two antithetical concepts. We shall see with what right and by how much. At issue then is the question of freedom or unfreedom in history. Hegel possesses the concept of natural history, but astonishingly he fails to redeem the promise implicit in the term nature. Nature makes an appearance only as the natural basis of history, that is to say, in the shape of the geographical conditions in which historical events are enacted, or else in the elements of physical anthropology, which, ominously enough, come under the heading of race. In their execution, the dialectics of history and nature in Hegel fall short of their own ambitions. He does not advance beyond the creation of more or less separate spheres that are supposed to be transformed into one another. The internal mediation between these categories is neglected in favor of treating entire spheres on block. This introduces a pattern, a mechanism, that is hardly compatible with dialectics. Adorno is concerned with internal mediation, not with the foundation of history and nature. In other words, he wishes to define even the sphere of spirit in Hegel as nature, since spirit is regarded as the quintessence of an unconscious domination of nature. At the very point where history unfolds in its most uninhibited manner, it takes on the qualities of blind nature instead of distancing itself from them, 
as Hegel's theory would reasonably lead us to expect. The fact that until now, history has been natural history, and that while seeming to be distanced from nature, it becomes ensnared in it, is evident from a glance at Durkheim's sociology. Durkheim is instructive because he combines a very specific construction of history and society with a highly emphatic claim about its naturalness. Durkheim's method was statistical. We may remind ourselves of Kierkegaard's mockery of suicide statistics that are in conflict with the autonomous individual of his theory. However, the theory of both men is, observ is absorbed by nominalism, the law of the greatest number to be understood nominalistically. An average is extrapolated from the universe of observed cases. The law makes no claim to have any conceptual autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the phenomena it represents. The law of the greatest number functions by defining objectivity as natural history in contrast to the independent individuals who rise above it subjectively. Marx makes a point of confronting Hegel on this issue, even though he agrees with him in claiming that objectivity asserts itself over heads of individuals and through their actions. Even when a society has got upon the right track for the discovery of the natural laws of its movement, or my standpoint from which the evolution of the economic formation of society is viewed as a process of natural history, can less than any other make the individual responsible for relations whose creature he socially remains however much he may subjectively raise himself above them. The idea of natural laws governing history, the idea that social entang entanglements are the natural outgrowth of history, goes together with the unfreedom of the individual. There is this to be said about the interpretation of Marx. In contrast, the prevailing belief that Marx had a positive view of the natural laws of society and that one needs only to obey them to obtain the possibility of the right kind of society. In contrast to this belief, Marx wishes to get beyond them into the kingdom of freedom, i.e. to escape from the notion of history as natural history. As Alfred Schmidt has shown, Marx is not concerned with Feuerbach's anthropological concept of nature. On the contrary, he reinstated Hegel's dialectical idea of nature in explicit rebuttal of the young Hegelians. There's a contradiction here. On the one hand, Marx speaks with the scientist's passion of the inexorable laws of nature in particular of the evolution of the laws of economics. At the same time, however, these laws are shown to be a mystification, an illusion. It is this twin-tracked attitude that provides the key to understanding Marxism as a critical theory, and not the thesis of the natural laws governing society that we need to understand if we are to gain a hold on them. It is that thesis that is the cause of the reification, the perversion, and sclerosis that we discover when people appeal to Marx today. When we see in a passage late on, late on in Capital, the law of the capitalist accumulation metamorphosed by economists into a pretended law of nature, the contradiction is what constitutes the dialectical medium. Accumulation does not refer to a man hoarding money, but to the situation in which the profit of an economic cycle is turned into capital once again, is reinvested in the new cycle. The organic nature of capitalist society is both an actuality and at the same time a socially necessary illusion. The illusion signifies that, within this society, laws can only be implemented as natural processes over people's heads, while their validity arises from the form of the relations of production within which production takes place. This should not be regarded ontologically as a doctrine of so-called human beings. In the kingdom of freedom, these laws would cease to be valid. Kant's kingdom of freedom is confronted by the kingdom of necessity, which... Soviet dialectical materialism prolongs and dubs the kingdom of freedom. Just as individuals have not existed hitherto, so too there has been no global subject. The two are corollaries of one another. Hegel avoids the problem with the ruse, the cunning of reason, a global subject devoid of subjectivity. It is cunning because it is detached from all personality. It confronts human beings like an abstract calculus. In this way, the unconscious history of nature is continued. Through an irony, Marx, in contrast, was a social Darwinist. He has a critical view of natural history. The Grand Ries contains a passage. As much, then, as the whole of this movement appears as a social process, so much does the, does the totality of the process appear as an objective interrelation, which arises spontaneously from nature. 
The natural laws of society are ideology in as much as they are claimed to be immutable. They are actuality in as much as they are hunted down and capital as the phenomenology of non-mind. In the chapter on fetishism, Marx speaks of the theological niceties of the commodity form. He thus mocks the false consciousness that acts as a mirror to the parties involved in the process of barter, reflecting back to them as characteristics of things what in reality is a social relation. Here, ideology tells the truth about society as it is, denouncing it as heteronomous. But by elevating the truth about the false society to the status of positive knowledge, i.e. by by abstracting from that denunciation, it turns into ideology. If you take dialectics with the seriousness due to it, ideology ceases just to perch on the substructure of society. The element of ideology is implicit in the exchange relation itself, abstracting from the specific circumstances between people and the commodities, an abstraction that is necessary in the process of exchange, gives rise to false consciousness. The essence of false consciousness is that it reflects mere postulates as qualities of the things themselves. Without this crucial factor, the monstrous mechanism of exchange could not survive. We are speaking here of a violence that is perennially intrinsic to ideology, because ideology is not an extraneous false consciousness, but is something that sustains the entire mechanism. The idea that theory becomes a real force when it grips the masses proves to be valid not simply for the theory of the commodity, but all previously existing structures. Hegel had a flash of insight into this, but it is at any rate utterly essential that the Constitution should not be regarded as something made, even if it does have an origin in time. On the contrary, it is quite simply that which has being in it and or in and for itself, and should therefore be regarded as divine and enduring, as exalted above the sphere of all manufactured things. But his insight was blind, since he idolized as something existing in nature, something that had been manufactured. Hegel fails to expose it as an illusion. What Marx adds as a philosopher is the consciousness of this illusion. Hegel presents as physé, existing in nature, something that is thesé, has been posited. He defines the constitution of the historical world as something belonging to the world of nature. State constitutions should not arise from the conscious act of individuals. Hegel's logic sets out to provide a radical dialectics, but without going so far as to overthrow the ideal of a prima philosophia, Hegel sympathizes with the idea of an immutable aspect of history whose totality is intact. Spirit and reconciliation transfigure the myth. Whatever is by nature contingent is subject to contingencies, and this fate is therefore itself a necessity. Occidental nature myths already rehearsed what Hegel predicted of history. The cycle is an archaic image. Hegel's philosophy of history still appeals to an automat automatism over which history has no power. The world historical political drama is perceived as a second nature, but the first nature recurs in it. Criticism of Hegel is directed at the fact not that he perceived history as second nature, but that he would like to confirm its status as a zone of the spirit, and that he naively identifies as a positive feature of history the very aspect that is incompatible with the freedom that he also intends.